All right, cats and kittens, this is uh, Jason Nuttall here. Uh, today I'm going to do a drawing of my favorite all-time superhero character, the ever-loving blue-eyed Thing. Uh, the Thing, also known as Ben Grimm, uh, was created in 1961 by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee in the Fantastic Four comics. Uh, let me see, let's... Uh, If you notice, I'm very, I draw kind of sketchy, as in I, I leave the paper with my pencil quite often. I'm just trying to block my composition. I might change this along the way. Looks very uh, amateurish right now, but it'll get better. Hmm, let me see how I want. Alright, I'm going to have him at an angle. Normally I don't do these guidelines, but I figure what the heck. If it helps other people. If they're watching this to learn. Uh, the artist that... Uh, I follow a lot with uh, when it comes to uh, comic book art. Um, John Byrne, Jim Lee, George Perez. I was never really a big fan of Jack Kirby's artwork. Um, I always appreciated and enjoyed his creativity and what he was able to um, create for the comic book world. But some of his work was just not wasn't top notch. It wasn't um, didn't live up to the legend really. But one thing that I've always enjoyed was his um, his thing drawings. And one of the nice things about drawing the thing, it's kind of an escape from what I usually draw, which is more re realistic. I don't have to worry so much about having just the perfect proportions and everything when I'm drawing the thing because he doesn't look like a normal person because he's been turned into a creature by gamma rays he you know the thing thinks of himself as a as a monster and you know I'm I'm old school which I usually don't like using that phrase but in this case it's true where you know I grew up with the thing and Wolverine from the X-Men they were cigar chomping tough guys I know it's not you know uh, correct politically correct or whatnot to have characters smoking and whatnot and I do not uh, promote smoking in any way sense or form but these are fictional characters. So I'm not all that concerned. I mean, if you look at the imagery of, like, Santa Claus, he's a fi for the most part, he's a fictional character. And then every so often you see him smoking a pipe. If you know me, you know that I'm a huge fan of Popeye the Sailor. Of course, he's one of his trademarks is smoking a pipe I can't guarantee this is going to be a top quality drawing I'm just kind of drawing for the sake of drawing sometimes you have to do that to get the juices flowing I'm going to go for a little bit more drama in the picture I'll give him a neck today. I don't always give the thing a neck because if you look at uh, like Jack Kirby and John Byrne, they didn't usually have a neck on the thing. Add a little bit of shadow here. One of 
the kind of fun parts about drawing the thing is drawing the rocks. I'm choosing to go with the uh, classic look of the thing where he's got the blocks of rocks. Like a puzzle. Um, originally the thing had more of like a... a kind of like a... what do you call it? Um, looked more like uh, mashed potatoes. The way that Jack Kirby drew him. So it looked, he didn't really look like a, a pile of rocks necessarily. That's what he was supposed to look like. But I, from what I've read, uh, Jack Kirby was trying for a, originally was trying for like a dinosaur hide. He was trying for more of the monstrous look of the thing originally and then after a while he just started making the panels like this and from what I've also read some of that had to do with the inkers that he would have so these panels here these are the uh, the more traditional look for the thing but I was trying to demonstrate up here what it looked like back in the old days. And John Byrne brought this look back um, in the early early 80s, I do believe, 81, 82. When uh, Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic, tried to fix Ben so he can be back to a, being a normal human being. But something happened in the uh, transformation and he wound up looking like his original self where he had the the uh, mashed potato look. Now one look that I always loved was uh, created by Keith Pollard in the Fantastic Four in I think it was like 1989-88 where he he gave spikes to the thing. He was, uh, thing was hit with radiation again and he ended up having uh, I call him porcupine thing where he was taught he was bigger he was much stronger and he had these giant spikes all over his face and he had kind of a uh, let me see how did he how did that go something along this line you know the spikes came all over the place on him and I always thought that was a really cool look I'm not big for changing the um, the original concept for for characters but I really did enjoy this this concept of the thing this version of it so he had um, a rim along his face on both sides and he had the spikes all over he also had a tail which I thought was kind of strange but um, I met Keith Pollard a couple of years ago at a convention that I was uh, doing as I was an artist at and uh, I, rec I hired him I commissioned him to do a drawing of porcupine thing and uh, he was kind of shocked he's because I also told him that he was one of my favorite uh, thing artists and uh, he and he's like really are you sure you're not thinking of Ron Wilson because Ron Wilson did uh, did the solo thing comics uh, for quite a few years I want to say like 10 years but I'm not sure if that's accurate um, and he also worked, I think he worked on Fantastic Four, but Keith Pollard worked on Fantastic Four um, and created the spike thing and I always loved that and uh, he drew me, uh, he did a drawing of the uh, of my porcupine thing and he told me that this is the first time since he was on the Fantastic Four run that he has drawn um, this version of the thing so I was very excited and it turned out great he actually did a full body drawing 
I did not expect that. So what I did is I started off with the basic um, thing look, um, just to show you what it would look like. And, he, and in the face, he still has when he uh, when he had the the porcupine look. He still has those sim those lines, but um, the rest of his body was made out of spikes. And the, this rim here for his brow, if I remember correctly, is the same as always. And as I was talking, I wanted to show you what it what it looked like when the the thing had the um, the spikes. And I was, I was just going to dabble with it, but now I think I'm going to finish it as. Um, the spiky thing and I might not be quite accurate with the representation of it but I'm kinda close and I'm sure um, I'll be ha I'm sure I'll be happy with it because uh, right now it's all I've never actually I've only drawn the spiky thing once and I had to use reference material to look at it to make sure I got it right um, I'm not using any reference material this time, so anything that I do here I'm going to be happy with. I'm going to add some shadow underneath here for a little bit of drama, plus the cast shadow. And I know it's kind of hard to see with, with the um, shine of the, the light from the camera. you want to have a variety of sizes. You don't want to have all the same size spikes. It becomes monotonous and boring. So have some large, especially along his shoulders, almost like a um, like spiked, uh, what do you call it? Spiky suspenders. They come across, they come over, the giant spikes come over his shoulder on each side of his uh, head from his shoulders. And you see I want to give this a little bit more width on his chest. There we go. I think that works better. And I've seen other artists who did the uh, the spiky thing look. And uh, you know, there's one artist in particular, and I, you know, I'm not trying to badmouth because I think he did great work on it. But um, one that kind of stood out that I wasn't very impressed with was um, oh, uh, Ch -ch -ch Todd McFarlane. Um, he did a uh, was it Spider-Man? It was just like a couple of uh, panels of a Spider-Man book when he was on the Spider-Man run. I think that was with Dave Michelini or Michelini, but um, and it looked it looked all right, but um, you know it, he wasn't set out to do that for his for a career or anything. So, but I didn't see very many people do the the spiky thing at the time. So that's why that kind of stood out, was because his was uh one of the few that did do the the spiky thing look and, is it, and, and uh, McFarlane's version wasn't that bad I mean it wasn't bad it's just uh, it was a little rough and I, this doesn't look right here I do end up doing a lot of re drawing and redrawing and I know my hands in the way of the picture you're just gonna have to deal with it There, that's better. I think I might just make this one dark back here. And do some 
some spikes here. And what I noticed uh, Pollock would do, or not Pollock, Pollard, uh, Keith Pollard would do is he would have the base of the spikes be black for some shading. Maybe not as sloppy as I'm doing right now, but you get the idea. And for the larger spikes, you might not, he, you know, he, he wouldn't do that because he wanted those spikes to stand out a little bit more. Now Keith Pollard, I do believe, is uh, is Michigan based, so. Um, you can find them at some smaller conventions, not the Motor City convention um, so much, but some of the smaller conventions in the Mich uh, Michigan area. Usually down and around uh, like Detroit, Grand Rapids, stuff like that. One other thing that I really liked about this run of the um, Fantastic Four with the thing is um, this was the first thing was the leader of the group because uh, Invisible Woman and Mr. Fantastic left to uh, they left so they could raise their family um, at that point it was just them and Franklin Richards uh, they hadn't added Valeria back um, yet I know that I'm pretty sure I got I have to do some study on this but um, you know back in the 80s John Byrne was uh, was the artist for the Fantastic Four and he had had um, uh, the invisible woman pregnant but she had a miscarriage and um, I'm thinking that somehow that ended up becoming Valeria like 20 years later or something like that. Like I said, I'll have to look into it. Okay, let me try something with the lighting here. It might help out. Eh, it's not bad. Trying to figure out what I what is going on in a certain in this spot here because I don't know. Let's bring another couple spikes here. Like I said, I'm not going by any reference material right now. I'm just going by memory, and my memory is awful. So. This will help add a, a little bit of dimension here. Because the thing is turned a little bit, we're going to be able to see the edge of his ridge here. I don't know what to call that thing. This is a no pun intended. that his mouth is still showing. And when you're drawing teeth, when it comes to um, reality or... Eh, I think I want to move the mouth a little bit. Um, or if you're doing like comic book art or something, you don't want to draw like every single tooth. It makes it awkward looking. Unless it's a real 
uh, an extreme close up. Now I also got the opportunity to meet uh, George Perez a few, quite a few years ago and um, great guy, so was Keith Pollard. I haven't had very many negative um, interactions with comic artists or comic writers over the years. I've heard bad things about different people but I've never had a problem myself. It still does not look right to me. And um, I uh, commissioned George Perez to do a drawing of the thing for me. And uh, what I thought was great was when I uh, wrote him about it, he asked me if he wanted cigar or no cigar. And I was like, oh, cigar, of course. I wasn't even thinking about it, really. Being the times that we're in, I just kind of assumed it would, I didn't even think about cigar. Yeah, I'm going to have to look at the look an image of this later to see what is not working in this drawing. And it's early in the day. I'm going to make excuses. It's early in the day. I can't picture things the way I want to right now. So, and, and, uh, as I was saying, when you're drawing a, a mouth on somebody and it's open mouth, you don't want to draw all the all the teeth. Um, you might want to show like show a line here and there maybe, but you don't want to show each and every tooth. I tend to bring in the the pink of the gums. I feel like he's looking too cutesy, and I don't want him to look cutesy. I've always that's one thing one of the reasons I've always liked the thing and Wolverine is their gruffness. And I don't know why they've never been teamed up. Back in the seventies and eighties they did a Marvel team up comics. And it was usually Spider Man teaming up with somebody, but there were a lot that had uh, the thing teamed up with somebody because the thing was pretty popular. Um in the 70s and early 80s. I honestly don't know why that popularity died down. I think it's because of the, the emergence of Wolverine, really. Um, but they never had the thing team up with Wolverine. In the 90s, like early 90s, when Paul Ryan was the artist, um, they had the new Fantastic Four, which consisted of um, Spider-Man, Wolverine, Hulk. It was Gray Hulk with the, uh, the mind of Bruce Banner. Uh, Ghost Rider, Spider-Man, Wolverine, and Hulk. Because, and this is when Arthur Adams was the artist uh, for the mini uh, the little mini series, or er, not mini series, but uh, multiple storyline in the Fantastic Four and uh, the original Fantastic Four, the real Fantastic Four um, had been um, incapacitated I guess you could say and so the survivor Susan Richards who ended up being a Skrull um, sought after uh, some recruits in Logan, Spidey, Hulk, and Ghost Rider. And you know, of course everything worked out in the end. Fantastic Four wasn't really dead. But, um, I think it was a, th pretty sure it was a three-part uh, storyline. But then later on, 
um, in the when Paul Ryan was the artist, uh, Johnny Storm, aka the Human Torch, was wanted for um, burning down a part of a university because his powers were out of control. And so the the new Fantastic Four stepped in, and during the battle, Wolverine got into a berserker rage and wound up slashing the Thing's face. And uh, wound up scarring the Thing, because his, uh, what do you call it, his hide, his, uh, his rocky hide, had been um, slashed by Wolverine's adamantium claws. So his face is all tender and stuff, and uh, that's where the thing started wearing a um, a metal mask or metal helmet to cover up his face, so he wouldn't get hurt as much. Any, as much. And uh, that was only. And then later on, um, Wolverine apologized to him. Much uh, I don't even know, like ten issues later or something like that. <laughs> But they did battle before, um, when the Fantastic Four battled the X-Men in the early 80s. That involved Doctor Doom, and it was when uh, they were, the X-Men were trying to get Kitty Pride um, some help because she was constantly um, in a ghost-like form. And the thing was able to, uh, you know, fight off Wolverine in the best way I I could think was uh, you know, hold his arms back and hit him. Because a lot of people, you know, people underestimate the strength of the thing. He was the the strong man in the Marvel universe, and then they created uh, the Hulk, and then I, in my opinion, they overpowered the Hulk. But the thing is one of uh, the Hulk's um, challengers, one of the ones that does battle with the Hulk very regularly. But, uh, especially over, you know, in the last 25, 30 years, they've made a huge deal about Wolverine. And uh, the nice thing about the X-Men uh, versus Fantastic Four run was that um, Wolverine wasn't as uh, tough. I mean, he was, but he what? They didn't over um, overplay his strength because really he he has the strength of a normal person. It's just his adamantium skeleton gives him more um, more power to his punch, basically. So he's not super strong, but sometimes they make Wolverine's uh, strength way too big, or way too strong. And don't give me, Wolverine's my second favorite uh, Marvel character. But there are times where they, uh, the creators of the comics at the time are getting a little carried away with the kind of power that they're giving some of these characters. As you can see what I'm doing, I'm just trying to fill in. This is pretty much what um, Keith Pollard did with his, the figures, but I don't, well, he probably did pencil everything, <clears throat> which if you see, if you notice while I'm doing this, this is taking forever to do all the shading and all the spikes and whatnot. Especially when I keep adding some, but I'm also trying to different sizes. And I didn't even finish the head, I popped over to the body. And the pencil mark, the, the penciling was probably going to be temporary. I'm most likely going to be inking this. Just not right now, because this is a pretty long video so far.
but one thing you don't want to do when it comes to if you're drawing like the more um, basic thing or uh, more common thing with these kind of rocks you don't want to keep just lines you want to have a thick different thicknesses and lines line differentiation a difference in line thickness and darkness that way you don't risk the monotony of the same lines over and over again I'm also using some hatching for some shadows helps create texture, helps create shadow like to do a few cracks here and there, you know, because it's rock, it's not going to be perfect. Cross hatch, cross hatch, cross hatch, cross hatch. Let's see how that looks on the screen. Alright, that looks alright. Add a little cast shadow underneath his wee little nose. This almost looks good. Now the disadvantage to drawing like this, where I have the uh, paper flat on a pa on uh, on a table like this, is I'm I'm constantly rubbing my hand across. I'm kind of out of practice doing this, but when I do illustration like this, I usually draw on a tabletop like this, or have some like an angle at least, so I'm not constantly rubbing the pencils all over the place. But when I'm drawing a like a photorealistic image, I will um, post it up. I'll use an easel and keep my hand off the paper. I'm kind of digging this. don't want to just go with uh, especially with something that's rocky you don't want to stick with just lines I maybe mean, bring in some uh, dots here and there some like half circles to give it a little bit of grit Okay, and then this is the uh, other side of the that weird rim. As I'm drawing this, I realize that I. Uh, the thing only has that weird rim here on his face, not on his head, so that's why I got rid of that. And 
nice w when you add the shadows like this it also helps to uh, bring out some of the other areas that are lighter so now that I've added this shadow here on this spike his rim his ridge here stands out more A lot of times when I'm doing these drawings, I don't really have too much of a plan, which is not always, not really a good idea. I just start to draw. Sometimes I do have an idea in my head, but I should probably sketch it out first and then start drawing it, but I end up getting impatient with myself and just go for it. And that's where a lot of the uh, redrawing takes place. All I knew coming into this was I was going to do a drawing of the thing on camera and share it. I still have not finished the, top of the head. I get distracted. And if I knew how to fast forward a video, I would, but I'm not that technologically savvy. can't whistle. I also like the thing when he's like this. Not, uh, you know, earlier I mentioned spiky thing, porcupine thing, also pineapple thing. closer I bring these hash lines together, the darker that area appears. The farther away I make the lines, the hash, hatch lines, the lighter they appear, that area appears. Just a little, uh, little word of advice. Now when the thing was this size in this uh, in this uh, version at the time the Hulk was um, in his gray version but he was smaller he was gray he had intelligence but he wasn't Bruce Banner he was um, <laughs> he was uh, oh what do you call it a uh, an enforcer in, in Vegas kind of like a basically a bouncer for a mob boss in Vegas called in the Hulk's name was Joe Fixit. He wore a gray suit. And but he was um he had a he had a temper and he had intelligence but he was uh wasn't as strong. So the thing actually had uh, power more power over him. When he was when the thing was in this uh was like this. I know it was 40 minutes watching me draw is exhilarating. 
I don't know if the moments of silence are a good thing for you or a bad thing. But sometimes I just end up having nothing to say, so I just quit talking. You also want to give, when you're, if you're drawing the thing, you want to have a, show a little bit of uh, thickness in the rocks. So give a little bit of an edge to it. I cannot get finished with the head, can I? I think I made the these spikes too tall. Yeah, I think that's looking better. And you can probably hear my kids' dogs in the background. They bark at everything. Makes it tough to teach since I, and I teach online. getting uh, blurred out by my hand. And for those of you who are not aware, um, back in, a, was it 2015, Marvel Comics quit uh, making Fantastic Four comics for the first time since their creation because in their eyes it wasn't making enough money they weren't selling enough books but it was also around the time that the newer Fantastic Four movie came out and that didn't go very well that movie and Marvel didn't own the rights to it anymore so a lot of uh, speculation is that Marvel did not want to promote a comic that somebody else has the rights for in the, to make the movies. But just recently, and I think it was in September, uh, Marvel decided to bring back the Fantastic Four. Comic books. Coincidentally, around the time that um, Marvel got the rights back for um, from Fox for uh, like film and TV distribution, and it was actually decent timing because uh, you know for as most of you already know Stan Lee just passed away who is the co-creator of the Fantastic Four it was his uh, if it wasn't for the Fantastic Four Marvel Comics probably wouldn't exist because Stan Lee was going to give up writing comic books but he had an idea for a book and his wife encouraged him to continue with the idea of this book and basically if that book didn't work out then he could quit writing for comic books who wound up becoming a co-plotter 
and they created Fantastic Four number one, and it was a huge hit, and it and it launched the uh, Marvel universe really. Now, you know, of course, Captain America was created in, uh, what was it, 1944, 1945, but he was created by, um, by Jack Kirby and Joe Simon. I, if I remember right, Stanley worked for the company, which was called Timely Comics at the time. But he didn't work on Captain America. And they also had the, the original Human Torch and Namor the Submariner. But those comics fizzled away after the war. Captain America disappeared. And eventually, to tie. Timely Comics, pretty, I want, I'm pretty sure it was Timely Comics, became Marvel Comics. But they were mainly doing like monster comic books and uh, romance books and cowboy comics. shrink these down a little bit that are matching the uh, the larger spikes a little too much I think this is about done. I put my artist's signature. 2018. And I do believe we're done with the pencil drawing. The inking should take, shouldn't take as long, but I bored you guys for almost an hour. So um, let me know what you think. Uh, share if you're interested in sharing. And you guys have a great day.